Okay. Welcome everyone, hello. We're just waiting a couple more seconds and we'll get started. Wait for a few minutes or a couple seconds and a few more people can come in. Okay, this is great. We have a lot of participants coming in. This is terrific. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening to learn about wildlife in winter. My name is Holly Bernini, and I'm the Director of Development for the Goodnow Library Foundation. Today, we are happy to be collaborating with the Sudbury Valley Trustees. I'd especially like to thank Debbie Pullen at the SVT for helping us to pull this evening together. And of course, we are very grateful to Dan Stimson for being with us tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are at the Goodnow Library Foundation. The Goodnow Library Foundation was formed as a charitable organization more than a decade ago to support the growing needs of Sudbury's Goodnow Library. We provide funding for capital improvements, such as physical refurbishments and renovations and technology that are not supported by the town and the state. In addition, we host events and activities geared towards bringing members of our community together we introduced the Be Bold series, speaker series in 2017 as a forum for sharing viewpoints and inspiring uh, conversation and discussion. These evenings have focused on a range of topics from art and science to travel, parenting, and climate change. And tonight we are happy to bring you the presentation on wildlife in winter. Now, before we start also, just a few housekeeping items. First, we have folks joining us from all over. So please feel free to find the chat button at the bottom of where you're uh, at the bottom of the page and enter where you are tuning in from and how you learned about our program tonight. Second, we are recording this event and barring any technical difficulties, we will post it on our website and we'll push out the notification when it is live. Third, everyone's camera is off, as you know, just the presenter video is being recorded and streamed and everyone is also muted. So we ask that you please submit your questions using the Q&A feature that's on the toolbar at the bottom. Our foundation's Kristen Schneider is with us this evening and she will be monitoring the Q&A. And again, please don't use the chat feature for your questions. The questions that are submitted will be addressed at various points in the program. And now I'm going to turn it over to Debbie Pullen. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Um, so we are so thrilled to be with the Goodnow Library Foundation tonight. And thank you, Holly, for inviting us and for creating this collaboration with us. We're thrilled. Um, so when I saw the list of the folks registered, I saw a lot of familiar names through SVT and a lot of new names and other um, neighbors from Sudbury. So I wanted to give you a, a couple um, little points about what SVT is. So my name is Debbie Pullen and I'm on staff at Sudbury Valley Trustees and we're a nonprofit land conservation organization and we're based in Sudbury but our work and we were founded in the Sudbury Wayland area but our work has through the years spread um, to a much larger area and this is our service area right here and it covers 36 communities that surround the Assabet, Sudbury, and Concord Rivers. And so that makes up our service area. Um, and we do all kinds of land conservation um, projects throughout the region. Uh, for those of you in Sudbury, our headquarters is based at Wellback Farm on Wellback Road. And we do have trails there and it's open to the public. So please um, come by and check it out. Um, actually, while I, while well, I'm on the subject, if anybody has a favorite trail that they love to walk on, if that's your kind of thing, let us know in the chat. I'd love to hear what your favorite place is um, during this time that everyone is finding the trails much more um, important. Uh, so we find that people have all kinds of reasons uh, why they support SVT and why they become members. And you know, a lot, there are a lot of reasons why we support land. Um, wildlife habitat is a big one, um, protecting open spaces so that we can 
um, protect the animals that live there is certainly a real key component of our work. And recreation and trails and having fun and being healthy is another huge important uh, motivator for our work. We also lately especially have been doing a lot of work with local farms uh, and being able to help them protect farms so that they can provide local food to our communities. Um, and you know, we might not always think about it, but having healthy land and protecting um, land around water really helps to save the quality of the waters. Um, and ever since the pandemic really hit us in March, we're really finding how important nature is for people. Um, we have had so much amazing support um, of people who are discovering us for the first time or really realizing how much um, the ability to go for a walk in, in peaceful nature really does help keep their sanity um, and gives them some exercise and fresh air at a time that they're really feeling stuck at home um, and, and things are really stressful. Um, so we're really very grateful that this can be our, our small role in um, this pandemic time is that we're providing a really safe and healthy place for people to explore. Um, and the real problem <laughs> that still faces us is um, development continues to devour our green spaces. Um, development hasn't really slowed down during the pandemic. And in fact, um, our land protection projects have really um, gone through the roof, to be honest. <laughs> uh, we have, I think it's a record number of projects underway right now um, uh, throughout the region. We have, I, I think we're close to 16 current land protection projects that we're juggling. And in normal times and previously, it might have been two to three projects. Um, so, so the work is, is expanding. And what another part of the work that we do at Sudbury Valley Trustees is that once we um, protect land and we have land in our care, a, a big responsibility we have is land stewardship. And that's where Dan's team comes in. And he'll tell you a bit more about that during his presentation. Um, but here are just some of the things that we do to take care of. Land doesn't take care of itself. Um, a lot of work um, comes into it, especially when we have so many more uh, visitors now using our properties um, that our stu stewardship team, and we have almost 200 volunteers uh, who help support this work. And without them, I call them our trail angels. We couldn't um, do the work that we do and really provide the safe space for folks to visit. Um, and the, the third area uh, that we work in is engagement in its programs like this. We have um, also a lot of webinars that we've been running. And in spring, I will be uh, bringing forth a whole new set of webinars. Right now, you can go to our website and see some recordings of ones that we started in 2020. Um, and hopefully when we get back outside and can meet together again, uh, the photo on the right shows a whole bunch of folks um, during a bird, doing a birding uh, outing together. Um, so it's really important that we help connect our communities with nature. Um, and that's an important role that SVT plays in our community. Um, so now more than ever in these days when we are reminded that we need nature, um, nature truly does need us. And I know we have a number of members who are on the call tonight. So thank you personally, um, we really appreciate the support. And as I've said, we've really had even an outpouring of support um, since this whole um, change has happened. And uh, if you're not yet a member, but you love the outdoors and you love wildlife, and this is your kind of thing, then I'd say we're your kind of organization. Um, so check out our website if you haven't already, it's svtweb.org, and you can get trail maps and ideas for local places to walk. Uh, we are selling our trail guide on there, which is um, actually that's an old photo, but our new our new uh, book is 42 Walks West of Boston. And if you become a new member, you'll actually get a free copy of the book. Um, and you can learn more about our habitat restoration projects, upcoming programming, um, all the stuff that we do in this in this region. So um, thank you and enjoy. I'd like to now turn it over to Dan Stimson and to, by way of introduction, um, 
Dan is the Assistant Director of Stewardship for Sudbury Valley Trustees. He manages the trails, trail access and infrastructure for SVT's reservations and conservation restrictions. And he works with our volunteers to maintain more than 65 miles of our trails. Dan also manages our GIS, which um, prepares maps for properties and projects. And he also works with other staff and partners to incorporate GIS and mapping into their work. Um, Dan is an excellent colleague, a great photographer, and I love learning with Dan. So uh, I wanted to uh, thank you again to Holly and the team for inviting us tonight and um, turn it over to Dan for his presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Debbie, and thank you to Holly and the Goodnow Library Foundation as well for hosting us tonight. Um, so we are going to talk about wildlife in winter. And so just to give you a little bit of an overview about what exactly we'll talk about tonight. Um, so first, we're going to focus on birds and how they handle winter. And then um, between each of these sections, we'll pause a little bit in case you have questions. So if you want to save them until the question slides, um, Holly can help handle that. And then moving on, we're going to um, talk about how mammals handle winter. And then the winter recreation opportunities that we have on our trails and some of the best conservation areas locally for those winter activities. Um, and all throughout this presentation, our um, photos are featured from our nature sighting sections. One of the fun things I get to do with SVT is collect photos from the public who um, share these great images of wildlife on our conservation areas and backyards and wherever they see them throughout our service area. And so um, I saw several of you on the registration list today have submitted photos. I think a few of you even have photos in this selection. So it's kind of fun to be able to feature these um, and be able to go back and look and find all of these great images that can kind of tell the story about how wildlife are adapted and able to handle our harsh winters in New England. So how do birds adapt? Obviously some leave. Um, so we're seeing some Canada geese flying here. A lot of people think that um, geese migrate for the winter. Some do, but some stick around. Um, so you can go out and find some Canada geese here. Some of those geese that we're seeing are resident populations, but also some are birds that have um, come in from further north. So the winter can be a really excellent time to see birds that we have locally that we don't necessarily have in other seasons. And so winter ducks are really a great thing to focus on in the winter. Um, so here we have a northern pintail that's in its breeding plumage and all of our ducks are, are sporting their best feathers right now. So it's a really good time to find open water like the reservoirs, rivers, um, some, a lot of the ponds are still um, open without ice now as well. So you can find um, really beautiful ducks this time of year. Hooded mergansers are another winter duck that we have quite a few of. So here, these were uh, photographed, I think, at Hager Pond in Marlborough. Um, and so you can see they're, they're little diving ducks that are going for fish. So the lead duck here on the left has a, has a fish in its bill. And uh, their cousins, the common mergansers, are really pretty this time of year. So that's the male in the foreground with the, the breeding plumage. And his mate is in the background there with a spiky plumage on its head. Ruddy ducks are another one that we don't necessarily see so often outside of winter. Um, they have that really kind of stout short tail that, that pokes right up there. Um, and they're kind of a fun one to highlight in the winter as well. And ring neck ducks as well. There's quite a few on our Sudbury Reservoir in Southboro is a really excellent place to see ring neck ducks in the winter. We also have some smaller birds that we don't usually see. And so this year in particular has been a really great year to see some of the birds that winter further north, but um, for whatever reason, food supplies are short up there right now. And so we're having this large eruption of, um, here's a, a red-breasted nuthatch, and we're um, just seeing more and more of these than we have in years past. And it's been fun to hear their little chirping throughout the, the forest as you walk on trails and they're showing up on bird feeders too. So we have the white breasted nuthatch as well, but these have that, these red breasted have that tawny color on their breasts, but they also have that really stark black eye line that makes them stand out a little bit more. In some years, we also have others like this crossbill 
come to our feeders as well that have erupted from further north and come take advantage of food supplies, both natural and also feeders. And so feeders are one of the things that are changing the dynamics of our bird populations in the winters. Here's a common red pole, which is another more northern species that makes its way down here and sometimes as well. And these are being seen this year too. So migration is really costly. Um, the birds have to spend a lot of time flying instead of feeding. So it has to be worthwhile. So obviously if you're that little hummingbird on the bottom left, you're not gonna stand a chance here in the winter. So it's worthwhile for them. Um, but other birds like this Northern Cardinal can tough it out here. And so they've been adapted um, more recently actually. And we'll talk about some other species that are, that are moving North as well to make it through these, these harsh winters. Um, that migration process is also um, makes them more susceptible to pred predation as they're flying into areas where they need to stop, fuel up, get a lot of food really quickly. They're really vulnerable to predators, hawks and, and other species as well. And in cases like this um, ruby-throated hummingbird here, a lot of them fly right over the Gulf of Mexico, which is an amazing feat if you think about the size of that little bird to fly over open sea like that um, is, is quite something. So how do we know about populations of birds in the winter? And um, really, we've had this excellent Christmas bird count that began in 1900 nationwide. Locally, the Concord Christmas bird count has been conducted every year since 1960. And so we're seeing a map here that's um, the focus area of the Concord Christmas bird count. Our other towns in our service areas also have their local bird counts as well, where they've been tracking these winter counts for quite a few years as well. And so it's a day when birders really focus on going out and find as many birds that they can and they'll count them. And over the years, that gives us a good idea of what populations are doing, what birds are moving into our area for the winters and what birds aren't making it here. And so I mentioned that we were having changes and so our warming climate has led to changes. Um, birds like this red-bellied woodpecker on the left the Carolina wren and even the tufted titmouse were not here all that long ago. So in the past 50, 60 years, populations have changed. Um, birds who are more southern species are able to push their way north. And there's also a lot of thought about how as we continue to change, some of the birds that we're used to having here are going to need to push their way north of here to deal with the um, warming climate as well. So maybe chickadees will be less common here and more common in Maine, for instance. But we also have these great owls that are really active this time. Um, they're predators, obviously. So their, their goal right now is finding mice and voles and um, getting ready to have a nest and raise young. So how is it the birds make it through our winters? Feathers is really one of the main adaptations that they have. So their downy under feathers keep them warm, it's great insulation. So a lot of birds have, um, as well as the, the downy feathers, a lot of their feathers are able to hold um, air between them really well to create that insulation. But they also have oil glands that they use to keep their feathers dry and to keep um, insulation by staying dry as well. Birds molt, so we talked about the ducks that have their breeding plumage in the winter, and that means that they've changed their feathers. And so a lot of species grow extra feathers for extra insulation in the winter. You might not think of Eastern bluebirds as winter birds, but they really are one of our great winter residents. And a lot of people are surprised to see them. They're so, they stand out so well against the snow and that bright blue and their, their red breast really stands out. And they're here making a living in the winter. So they're, they're a fun one to look for. We have winter berries in our backyard and they do acrobatics hanging upside down, feeding on the winter berries throughout the winter. It's fun to watch. <clears throat> so other adaptations, um, birds have a lot of behavioral adaptations to make it through the cold times. Um, a lot of species will cache food. So if you watch if you have a bird feeder and you watch it really carefully, some birds will sit there and eat a seed by seed, but others will come and grab a seed and take it away. So 
black cap chickadees, for instance, are taking seeds and caching them in the little crevices in bark and trying to remember where they are and to eat those throughout the winter for leaner times. Birds also seek shelter. So um, the bird you're seeing, this barred owl on the right, is uh, roosting in a, a cavity of an old standing tree that's probably might still be alive but will be dead soon. So those standing <clears throat> dead trees are really excellent habitat for winter to provide those roosting um, opportunities for birds like owls. But gregarious species will also roost together for warmth and just um, to huddle together and, and make use of that body temperature. They'll also reduce their highly energetic activities. So activities all associated with mating take a lot of energy. And so if they can avoid doing those and push those off to spring, that's a really good adaptation. So they won't have to defend their territories by singing, by building and maintaining nests, by producing eggs and feeding chicks. And so that lets them focus on their, their individual health. So here is a scene at a local, I think this is at our Lions Cutler Reservation in Sudbury. It's a wetland where there's a lot of ducks and geese all huddled together, kind of taking it slow and taking advantage of shelter and also each other's um, body heat. <coughs> Red-tailed hawks are a really great bird to look for in the winter. So if you're driving and you see trees up in the sun, it's really, a good place to look for red-tailed hawks sunning themselves and looking for probably roadkill um, and other animals that they can that they can come out into the open and attack. This one I think has a squirrel between its talons. Bald eagles are also a really great species to look for in the winter um, when we don't have leaves. Some of these raptors are easier to see. This bald eagle perched in a snowy pine tree is a pretty common sight around here as um, the populations get healthier and healthier. And especially as we still have open water, the bald eagles will be able to make their living off of fishing and um, stay in our local areas. If we have really cold winters, these birds will move over to places like the Merrimack River where there's open water and it's ice free. But right now when we still have local rivers open, you'll see the bald eagles here. So birds also have a lot of physiological adaptations. They shiver, so it's a pretty simple thing and you might um, not think about it as an adaptation, but it's a really good method of gaining body heat. So they're, they're moving those muscles and making heat to warm up their bodies. Their legs and feet are also covered with specialized scales that minimize heat loss. And you often see, especially in ducks and geese, you might notice that, or seagulls too, um, they're, they're standing on just one foot and that's another way they'll tuck their second foot up into their plumage um, to reduce the heat loss that way. And they're constricting their blood flows to those extremities so that they're losing less heat by having um, less blood flow to those areas and, and lose heat that way. One of the most amazing facts I think is this, um, the chickadees can grow and shrink their brains by as much as a third. So I talked about caching seeds in um, crevices of bark. So that takes a lot of memory power. Um, and so they divert some of their energy in the fall to growing their brain and um, improving the neurological connections so that they can have that better memory for remembering where their um, seeds were cached. And then in the spring, when it's time to do all of those manning activities, that energy goes from the brain to other pieces of their body. So um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Torpor is also a pretty common um, adaptation uh, where birds can reduce their body temperature by as much as 50 degrees to conserve resources. So you can imagine some of these really small birds having to have higher body temperatures than we do requires a lot of food. So at night when those really strong cold winter nights hit, if they can drop their body temperature, it takes a lot less resources to make it through that time when they're fasting between the last meal and, and basically birds are feeding constantly throughout the day. So dropping that body temperature by 50 degrees really makes it possible to make it through those cold nights. Here's a, here's a really nice picture of a dark-eyed junco that's really 
showing that adaptation of puffing out its down feathers and creating as much airspace in its feathers as possible to um, create insulation. And that's a good bird to see throughout the winter as well. <clears throat> so sadly, some birds don't make it. Um, so despite all of those adaptations, um, many still succumb. So this is a, a ruby crowned kinglet. Um, which is one of the most fascinating stories of winter birds, I think. Um, it's one of our tiniest birds. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a nickel on the bottom left, and I brought one today. So if you can imagine holding a nickel, that's about the weight of one of these individual birds. Body weight is a big way to retain heat and make it through. So if you can imagine this little bird just weighing this, as much as a nickel, making it through a cold winter night, it's, it's fascinating that they're able to do that. So they have to consume two to three times their own weight daily just to keep up that 110 degree body temperature to really make it possible to have those fast flight muscles really working. So they seek out dense evergreens, they huddle in groups, and they go into that torpor mechanism that I talked about at night to make it through that fasting period. But one of the most amazing adaptations that they have is that they will lay two clutches a year of up to 11 eggs each um, each time. So one of their adaptations is just by um, sheer numbers. So on nights when you have a really big hit to your population, it's a benefit that they've reproduced so much in the, the summer season. So we can pause now for any questions on birds before we move on to mammals. Uh, so far, Dan, um, we don't have any questions. That have All right, up. great. We can keep moving. Okay, great. If you think of any at the end, um, feel free to include birds then as well. So mammals, um, it's, a, it's a similar story of challenge and uh, adaptations, but they have some different adaptations. So mammals, one of the things that they can do more so than birds is add fat. They don't have to take off and fly. They don't have to be so light that they can fly without a lot of energy. So they can, they can build up that fat store in the fall to make it through the winter. <clears throat> so you can see this, this beaver on the bottom right is practicing that uh, right now. But um, they'll also take advantage of nut crops in the fall. So bears, deer, rodents all take advantage of those um, good years when we have a lot of say acorns or other seeds from trees. And this beaver, besides having put on a lot of body fat, will even um, add fat into its tail. So this beaver you can see is kind of sitting on its tail. That big fat tail that it uses for a defense mechanism to make a warning sign by slapping onto the water is also helping them out by holding on to some fat reserves and helping it stay warm in the cold winter, in the cold winter water too. Foxes are a fun um, species to look for in the winter. So here's a red fox. We have, we have two species. So this is the red fox. It's got that really beautiful red um, fur with the black legs and black tops to its ears and a white underbelly and a white tip on its tail. Differentiated a little bit from, this is a gray fox. Um, still a lot of red in a gray fox, but they're I guess a little bit closer to the ground, a little bit stouter. They don't have as long as the legs <clears throat> um, and they don't have that white tip on the tail either. A fun fact about a gray fox is that they are the only dog species that can do a little bit of climbing trees and they're here locally. Um, so that's pretty cool. So one of um, the way that mammals adapt is um, being really good at finding food. Um, so the winter is when predators can really shine. They can take advantage of weakened prey. And so here in the bottom right, you're seeing a coyote, another member of the dog family um, with a gray squirrel in its mouth. Deer and moose will physically adapt to a leaner diet in the winter. So throughout the growing season, they're eating a lot of leaves, but in the winter, they're having to survive on twigs and bark, and so um, their digestive situ, um, system changes enough so that they can get enough of nutrients from those leaner foods. And like those chipmunks, I mean, sorry, like the, the 
chickadees, chipmunks, beavers, and others are caching food as well. Um, so they're collecting, in, in the case of chipmunks, they're probably filling up their cheeks with acorns and other nuts and bringing them down into a little den and caching those for eating throughout the winter. Beavers, you can see here, will cache food under their under the water outside their lodge. So they're collecting also beavers similar to deer and moose in the summer, they'll be eating leaves and other vegetation greens. Um, but in the winter, they're really surviving entirely on inner bark. And so they will collect a lot of branches and jab the branches into the, the, the mud on the bottom of the pond and have a, an area that's deep enough so that it doesn't freeze to the bottom so that they can leave the entrance of their lodge and grab some of that food and bring it back and eat it in the dry spot. Beavers have a lot of amazing adaptations to make it through the winter. So um, <clears throat> one of the ones you can see here is the insulation that they'll have um, by building their lodge. And you can see, I think I can do my pointer. Yeah, so they'll encase their lodge with hardened mud to make it waterproof and to help with the insulation but they're smart enough that they leave this little chimney and so they don't encapsulate the top. And on really, really frigid mornings, you can actually see an active beaver lodge by seeing a little trail of um, beaver breath coming out of the top of a beaver lodge. So you can see kind of this little mist, misty wisp coming out of a beaver lodge. And so throughout the winter, they're um, in there with their kits and raising a family um, through the late winter months as well. So this is gonna be a little bit of a scene. This is from a, a nature settings contributor who had a trail camera out. Um, so this is a, an old rotting log and you can see a little mouse there. And that mouse probably didn't have a very good day. So this is a, a fisher, one of our uh, predators. It's the largest of the weasel family that we have. Um, reaching into that log, um, trying to get at that mouse. Kind of looks like he's having a good time of it too. Other members of the, the weasel family that you can see in the winter, this is a mink. Um, really excellent waterproof fur that you can see as it kind of basically floats on the water because of the insulation and in its fur. <clears throat> And we also have short and long-tailed weasels, and this is this is one of those. Um, they overlap a lot, so I'm not really sure which this is. I, I would guess it might be a long-tailed weasel, but um, this is on the smaller end of our weasel family here, and you'll see them in the winter as well. Coyotes. Um, so this is a, probably a time where you can hear coyotes howling outside your home at night. So they're going through their mating season, and um, in communicating with their their others in their group. And so you can see them also out in fields hunting rodents, mice, voles. <clears throat> so they'll use their fur to stay warm. So those really thick winter coats are helping with insulation. Deer and moose add hollow hairs, which trap even more air. Um, and a lot of species will just build up more of a fur layer in the winter, a heavier coat to help them deal with the cold temperatures. Um, some of the aquatic species, beavers, otters, and others work a lot to waterproof their fur with their oils. So here's a, an image of a, a beaver's hind foot and this toe right here, you can see features this split toenail and they have that as a specific adaptation to comb their fur. So they secrete this waterproof gland where they will take that um, comb toenail and work the oil throughout their fur to make a good waterproof service so that they can um, survive underwater where it's really at the freezing point just above 32. So another species obviously that's aquatic all through the winter is the river otter. This is a really great image of an otter coming up for the breathing hole. So um, if you see ponds with with holes like this in the center or also along the edge, it's a good indication that there's a good otter population there. And they'll do their hunting underwater. They'll they'll go and grab fish, crayfish, 
and, and everything else that lives down there in the pond. And will come up through these holes and often um, eat their meal on the ice. So it's a good good way to spot them if you're out on the edge of a pond in the winter. And you can often see their tracks on the, the snow on the ice as well. <clears throat> it's another shot of a coyote in the winter, a really pretty shot from a trail camera underneath some hemlocks. It's a good good display of how variable the coloration on coyote coats are locally. So that one I showed you before had a lot of gray and blacks in it. And this one is, is all kind of that tawny brown. So another adaptation to um, survive in the really cold lean times is just to simply conserve energy. And so deer will limit their travel and stay as close to their food sources and shelter as they can. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, when we have those winters where there is three and more feet of snow, it's really difficult for a lot of animals to move around, especially these um, large bodied animal animals when it gets up taller than their tails. And so times like that, they'll really stick to near their food and shelter locations. So some other species that you can look out for, and also um, we'll talk a little bit about tracking. Um, these are kind of fun to track because of those fingers you can see on the opossum. Um, and the opossum, and I think we've got a raccoon up next, are um, animals that you might see near your home. They kind of have adapted to take advantage of that interface where um, our backyards in the open space meet. <clears throat> So this opossum, I think, was hanging out under a bird feeder eating bird seed that, that fell to the ground. And that's an activity that raccoons will do a lot too. Um, and if you've ever been less than careful with um, keeping your bird seed safe, they'll, they'll figure out a way to get into your bird seed too as a good food source. So another species that is active all through the winter is our bobcats. Um, so this is a fun image of a bobcat from a trail camera. And they're moving around and hunting just like the coyotes and foxes are. So hibernation and sleep is a big adaptation that a lot of animals will use. Um, so woodchucks are true hibernators. Uh, their heartbeat slows down and their temperature significantly lowers to conserve energy. It's very similar to that torpor adaptation, um, but they'll just go underground and um, go to sleep for the winter. Um, we have other species like bears and skunks that sleep, but they'll awaken and will come out in warm spells. So they're not true hibernators like the woodchucks are. <clears throat> Chipmunks are one of those. So. Um, this was captured on a sunny afternoon where uh, we still had a good snowpack, but the chipmunk was warm enough that it was coming out to um, grab up some acorns and other things. So even if they're not um, sleeping or hibernating, seeking shelter is obviously a really good adaptation for making it through cold nights. Um, small mammals will tunnel in the snow so that snow layer even though you can think of snow as being cold is really an excellent insulator as well. So there can be a big difference to, um, you know, on those evenings and, and early mornings when it's down below zero, if we have a good pack of snow down near the ground can be sheltered closer to the freezing point. So it's a, a big difference in the amount of um, energy that it will have to go through the night. It also provides protection from predators. So that barred owl is um, out there at night looking for all of those little rodents. And if they're um, provided with that snowpack, they have a little bit better chance of surviving. Even though a lot of species like the barred owls and the foxes and the coyotes have good enough senses that they can actually um, seek out those, those little rodents under the snow, it's a much better chance for their survival. Larger mammals will also create dens or use thickets. So um, you can think of maybe a, a thick thicket of mountain laurel is even enough for some of our bears to overwinter in. Um, and so they'll create those dens for extra shelter for a longer term survival. So this fisher is poking its head out after a snowstorm. I think it was from a, a hollow in a tree that was covered by snow as well. Here's a porcupine. Um, 
So we have, this is on one of our reservations where the porcupine's trail was coming out of its den after every um, night, you could kind of see where it was going throughout the day for food. Um, so they're using those dens for shelter, but they're still active every day and night going out and getting food. So a lot of porcupines will be eating um, hemlock boughs, especially, and other uh, bark as well. And camouflage. Um, we have an example right here in Massachusetts of uh, both a prey and a hunter who uh, use camouflage in the winter. And so on the left, we have a snowshoe hare, um, not that common in our towns, but we have had sightings at uh, Cedar Hill. We had a, a snowshoe hare. Um, on the left, you can see their, their summer fur. And on the right, you can see how they'll change as an adaptation to camouflage in with the snow. And the the short-tailed weasel will do the same thing. So um, there you can see on the right, it's, it's winter fur, pretty amazing. Pause again, just in case we have any questions from the first two sections. Hi, Dan. Um, we've, we have a couple questions back to the bird segment, if you don't mind answering those. Right, yeah, I'll try. Um, one, our first question is, what can we do to help these birds? So um, <clears throat> feeding birds is definitely something that makes a lot of, makes it possible for a lot more birds to survive through the winter. Um, it's not a unanimous opinion of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing naturally, um, but it's certainly a common thing that um, people will do. And I, I would say that if you are thinking about feeding birds, definitely do it consistently. Don't start to feed birds and then cut them off or forget to fill it up. Because um, why they can probably go from neighbors back and forth, it's it's kind of, they once you start, they're relying on that. Um, so that can be one thing. It's definitely, um, that's, that's more accepted for birds. Um, you definitely don't want to be feeding any of our mammals. It really changes their natural behavior and is a less healthy situation. Okay. Another question we have are, is, um, do robins stay north during the winter? Yeah, so some do. And, and I, I, I meant to mention, I don't think I did. Um, some of the birds that we have throughout the winter are migrators and they're the same species, but it's not necessarily the same individual that he, was here in the summer. So the robin that we had in July might be further south, but we're seeing robins that summered in Maine or further north than that. Um, and we also will have individuals who will stay and, and stick it out as well. Um, so it can be hard to tell on an individual basis, but we definitely always have robins throughout the winter now. Okay, another question we have is, where locally have you seen golden crown kinglets? How recently? I they're really difficult to see. Um, so they make a living by um, living up in the top of those evergreens. And so they're, they're really difficult to see. Uh, they're tiny and they are hidden. Um, I haven't seen one in quite a while. Um, we had some submissions. One of the fun things about our nature sightings page is you can go back years and years. So um, on the left side of the page, you can, you can click on a species and you'll see at least where the town are. And often if people take a photo at a conservation area, they'll share the conservation area. So you could check that out too. We just had someone add that they saw some golden crown kinglets at Marble Hill and Stowe last winter. Just awesome, great. <clears throat> Another really good resource is eBird. Um, so you can go online on eBird, I think it's .org and you can search by species and see sighting locations down to specific points on a map um, from birders. So that's a really good one to check too. Great. Um, another question we have is what shrub is best for birds to huddle in during the winter? So I guess you would, you would want something um, with a lot of cover, right? So um, maybe you know, some of the mountain laurels that, that retain a lot of those leaves are good. Um, some of the, the shrubs that also provide cover are excellent. So we have um, greenbrier in some of our natural areas that are kind of a thorny um, tangle, but that's really excellent shelter for 
birds to avoid, like a small songbird to avoid a cooper's hawk or a sharp-chinned hawk. Um, and I think that most of the shrubs that you'll see on, in a backyard setting are more for that um, protection from predators rather than huddling for warmth. And I think that probably seek out better protection, you know, away from your yard in the forest and trees and, and larger branches for temperatures. Um, another question we have is which bird species go into torpor at night? Um, let's see. So the, I, I believe the black cat chickadee does. Um, I think that the kinglet may as well. Um, I'm not positive on others. Okay. And now we just have a couple questions um, about the mammals that we just discussed. Um, how do the chipmunks survive in the winter? And also do chipmunks hibernate? They might have been answered in your presentation, but just thought I'd bring those up again. Yeah, so they'll cache food. So if you see chipmunks in late fall, they're really busy and they're um, filling up their cheeks. So they have these, these fun pouches in their cheeks where they can put a bunch of um, seeds and nuts. So they're collecting those and bringing them into burrows underneath the ground where it's warm enough to survive. They're not true hibernators, um, so they're sheltering in there on colder days. And I've seen chipmunks this week where it's warm enough that they'll come out and, and do their thing and there's not snow cover. Um, so they're really, for the most part, surviving off of stuff that they've built up. Um, but on, on times like this, they can still go out there and find food as well. And, um... Oh, we got a couple more questions here. Um, any idea um, how the bobcat population is doing in these parts? Is it increasing, decreasing of late? Uh, reports are definitely increasing. Um, and I think that, you know, on a, a larger scale, um, Eastern Massachusetts bobcat population is certainly on the rise. Um, it's hard to tell, you know, year over year if it's just more people are seeing them or if they're really pushing out. Um, but we're hearing about bobcats further and further east, I would say, than um, in the past. And a lot of our towns have had bobcats for years and years. Um, they're pretty seclusive animals, so you don't see them a lot. And they're, they're pretty skittish for the most part as well. So um, they can be in the forest when you're hiking a trail and you might not notice them, but they're probably there. Great. Um, and I have two more questions um, about birds again. So then we can um, go on to the next section. Um, do Christmas lights on bushes deter birds from using the bushes for cover? That's a good question. I haven't ever <laughs> thought about that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I You're could see sure. if, it, if it lights it up in the night, I could see where that might be less than ideal. Right. <clears throat> and then the last question we have is, um, I'm in Berlin, larger farm property see many Carolina wrens all winter. Never have, yeah. never have seen them here before. They like the bluebirds, mealyworms, and suet. Any ideas? About, um, so they're definitely round and they, they have been for, for years. Um, locally, things may change, but there's certainly a species that have taken advantage of both feeding and especially a warming climate. So, um, there was, there was a lot of talk in, what was it, 2015, where we had those really heavy storms, um, was pretty difficult for a lot of birds. And Carolina wrens was one of them in particular, where the population took a significant hit because they're kind of, they're, they're working their way north. They're a Carolina wren, so they haven't been here forever. Um, and so when we have those outlier conditions of either really, really cold snaps or heavy snowfall where it's hard to find um, food if you're a bird, it can do a lot of damage to a population and take a couple years for the population to work back up. Um, and so fluctuations like that are definitely possible throughout a lot of our species, but especially those that are kind of on the edge of their northern um, range. And it can be fun to look through the Christmas bird count stats. So the Concord Christmas bird count, as well as the, the full Audubon count, you can go through in previous years and look at stats and see how populations change throughout the years. So that can be kind of a fun thing to do. Okay, that wraps up the question and answer section. For this. Great, all right.
So we'll move on to, to the people part. Um, we're still going to kind of uh, filter in some animal pictures along the way, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But um, I wanted to talk about how you can get out, especially this year when there aren't a lot of other options. Um, we're seeing a lot of people getting out on our properties. And um, if we finally get some snow, it can make things a little bit more fun. So snowshoeing is a really excellent activity on our local trails. Um, you can snowshoe on fresh snow, but it's also kind of a good exercise and activity to snowshoe when a trail is packed in. Um, Cross-country skiing is another good one. So I especially like some of our larger properties for skiing um, and with wider trails and a little bit gentler slopes. And we'll talk about some of those as I kind of go through some of the properties that have these opportunities. But it's important to remember that um, it's really pretty much always good time to get out and hike. Um, so when there's not enough snow to go snowshoeing and there's not enough snow to do good skiing, you can just get out and use the trails. Um, and a really good tool to do that is uh, the footwear that helps you with slippery conditions. So this is, I think, a Yak Tracks um, track um, that's a little spiraled piece of spring that goes that you can add to your boots to help you with your footing. Um, but just keep in mind that really that resource is always there. And um, it's fun once you get out and you won't feel cold and you'll get moving and um, you can take advantage of the same trails that you enjoy in the summer. One of my favorite activities in the winter is to go um, tracking. And really, you don't have to have a whole lot of experience to have fun. Um, you can still see a variety of tracks and um, tell the differences, even if you're not quite ready to identify individual animals from tracks. Um, but there's so many great resources, both in books and in local clubs, um, for learning tracking. If you want to get into it, it's a really um, Kind of a lifeline learning thing that you can do to really add a lot to your to your winter hikes and so all of those animals that we've seen throughout this presentation and that we'll see later are leaving signs out there in the forest and so why it can be while it can be really difficult to see a bobcat or to see a gray fox um, you can find their tracks and so you can kind of read that story as you go on a hike without disturbing animals and without um, being upset that you didn't see something, you can still kind of see their presence in the woods. One of the a, kind of a, a good free and easy to acquire place to start is this little pocket guide that Mass Wildlife puts out. So you can Google the Mass Wildlife tracking guide and print it out. And it has um, <clears throat> good information about the size and basic shape of individual um, tracks. I think as you learn a bit more, You'll want to see more like their gait and how how long and wide their gates are to really um, identify things. But this is a really great way to start off, as well as a nice way to see some of the more common species that you'd expect to see tracks and signs out during a hike. As I say, it's not really all about um, seeing individual species. It's also stories. So here. This is kind of fun. You can see this is the tail and body of a mouse that burrowed under the snow here. And then we're seeing a wing flap here. So you can imagine maybe a hawk or an owl diving at this, this mouse and maybe it was a close call or maybe it was a successful call for the bird. So our trails, um, as I said, there's so many opportunities to get outside and especially right now, um, it's a really great thing to do. And so you can go onto our website. We have um, free to download trail maps of all of our properties. So I think there's like 45 properties up there with trail maps where you can download a PDF from a map. <clears throat> we also have this interactive viewer where you can zoom in find a parking area near you or zoom way down to the level and see the actual trails. Um, and that's right on that trail map page with all of our brochures. So this is an example of, of going from our 36 town region down to Sudbury and then into a specific memorial forest. And you can click on the green dot and get directions to the, to the parking area. 
So Debbie mentioned that trail guide. Um, if you don't want to print out individual trail maps, you can also get this book with all of them together and directions to this to this pages and to the sites. <clears throat> but I wanted to go through some areas that are particularly good for snowy recreation. So um, not all of our properties are plowed out immediately. So some of the ones that I focused on here in this presentation have really good access short time after storms. So we we actually pay for a plow company to come out and um, clear the snow off of our parking area on Dutton Road in Sudbury for the Memorial Forest. <clears throat> but the, the other nice aspect of our Memorial Forest in the winter is it's got a really wide um, trail network that connects with Town of Sudbury Conservation Land, City of Marlboro Conservation Land, Massachusetts, um, Department of Conservation and Recreation, as well as the Assabet National Wildlife Refuge. And so you can really do, you could go for a long ski from Memorial Forest, but you can see there's also shorter options where you could choose um, snowshoeing or even just winter hiking is really beautiful at Memorial Forest. And so it's got um, <clears throat> a couple different ponds and three different streams that always look really beautiful in the winter. and um, there's enough difference in terrain, but also some good flat areas. So if the trails are slippery or if you want to go for a not too much of an endurance snowshoe, there's good opportunities here too. So um, several years ago, we did some habitat management work out here to improve the habitat of the pitch pine and scrub oak forest through Memorial Forest. And it has some of these open areas that are really pretty in the winter. Um, and so this is a good example of a snowshoe trail and a snowshoer out at the trails at Memorial Forest. <clears throat> and this is crossing over Hop Brook, which is um, fairly close to the entrance of Memorial Forest. Um, so there's also Trout Brook and Cranberry Brook and um, a lot of different opportunities to get close to water where um, wildlife is a little bit more common and active in the winter. And there's a lot of tracks usually along streams and ponds. So it can be a fun place to look for animal signs too. Another snowy trail scene of a snowshoe trail at Memorial Forest too, shortly after a snowstorm. Debbie mentioned our, our headquarters is at Wallback Farm. It's a really excellent place for a manageable snowshoe. Um, so our parking is, is always plowed because it's our office um, and there's a lot of good parking there. And it's a, a pretty manageable trail. It's like a three quarter mile loop um, and it's no severe hills. And so it can be a good family visit, especially if you have kids who wanna get out and try snowshoeing, it's a manageable distance. Um, <clears throat> and they're really pretty views. So we have our barn uh, across the road from the trails and there are those open areas as well as um, shrubs around the, the garden areas that we've uh, put there for wildlife use as well. Um, and the trails are wide and easy to walk for. So you can kind of walk next to each other. We have this uh, storybook trail with some newly installed um, stations from a local Boy Scout. Connor Goodwin put in these this winter. Um, and so you can go through, there are a dozen of these and read the story along the hike. And um, your child can, can start the book at the beginning of the hike. And by the time you finish that three quarter mile loop, you finish the storybook. Upper Mill Brook in Wayland, um, we're lucky enough to have um, the Peace Lutheran Church is, is really kind to let us use their parking area when church is not in service. So um, access is really excellent there. It's off of um, Concord Road 126 in Wayland, um, right from the Peace Lutheran Church. And it's another one that has a lot of loop options and um, a lot of excellent water uh, sources. So there's Mill Brook that flows through both SVT's portion as well as the town of Wayland's portions of Upper Mill Brook. And if you wanted to make a longer go of it, you can connect down to the Lower Mill Brook conservation areas as well. Um, 
but there's a lot of wildlife sign there. Owls are pretty common at Upper Mill Brook, so it can be fun to, to look for owls and owl pellets and um, go around the wetlands and see what there is for wildlife activity. There's also fields uh, next to some of the trails, so that kind of um, variety in habitat is, is nice when you're looking for wildlife as well. Um, those, those transition areas are really um, good spots for some of our more common wildlife. If you want to see deer, um, foxes, raccoons, often we'll use that transition area between fields and forests. Greenways Conservation Area, another one in Wayland, right at the end of Greenway um, off of um, 126, just south of the center of town and Sandy Burr Country Club. So it's located right along the Sudbury River, a really pretty stretch of the Wild and Scenic Sudbury River um, with views of the, the, the Sudbury floodplain, as well as um, really pretty pastoral views of open fields. Um, but also some really mature pine forests that are very pretty in the snow. Um, that's a really good one for skiing. I've seen quite a bit of uh, ski tracks out there. It's, an, it's another relatively flat one. So if you're a beginner, this is a really good option for you. Um, and it can be really great for snowshoeing too. You can see somebody skied over our long bridge there and through the fields on the, I think these are the south fields. Hamlin Woods and Mainstone Farm, the town of Wayland plows the, the new Mainstone Farm parking lot on um, the northern portion of Rice Road up here. Um, and it's, it's such a vast network that there is really a lot of options um, for a visit in any season, um, but the winter is really a pretty uh, time to visit Hamlin Woods. There are some, a lot of, a fair amount of beech trees in the Hamlin and the southern portion of Mainstone Farm. Some of them keep their leaves throughout the winter, so it can be a, a really pretty view in the winter. Um, and if you want to make a longer hike of it, you can go up over Turkey Hill and some of the town's other trails here on the east and south side of Rice Road and make a, a pretty significant loop. And it has um, views of the farm around the property as well. Brook Welch in Framingham has several access points um, from the adjacent Callahan State Park, which get a lot of good visitation in all seasons. Um, and there is more topography here than in some of the other ones I've shown. So this can be a little bit more of a challenging spot if you wanna get out for, a, a get your heart rate up more with some um, snowshoes or do some skiing on some hills. This is a, a really fun spot. It still has um, some fairly wide old forest roads for trails. Um, so it's good for winter sports like skiing. Um, and there's, as you can see, a lot of different options. Um, this also connects with our Bainingbrook Meadow Farm conservation restriction on the north side of Edmonds Road. So this is Edmonds that runs through here, as well as um, via the Bay Circuit Trail to Henry's Hill, Wittenborg Woods to the north of that, and even up to the Knobscot Scout Reservation into Sudbury. Um, so you can go via the Bay Circuit Trail for really a full day's hike. And if you head west on the Bay Circuit Trail, you can make it to the Burroughs Loop Trail, which is a, a 33 mile loop that goes through the four boroughs communities, Southboro, Marlboro, Northboro, and Westboro. Um, so you could really make a, more than a full day of it out on the trails here. Um, one of the one of the pretty aspects of Badingbrook Welch is along Edmonds Road here. We um, host a couple farms, so Stearns Farm and Hanson Farm, both have use of some of our fields. Um, so you'll get some of those open areas as well along your hike. <clears throat> One of our newer properties, the Smith Conservation Land in Littleton, we have a neighbor who's been kind enough to plow out our lot for us. Um, so this is a really fun one in the winter as well. Um, the habitat here is really excellent and there's a lot of good tracking opportunities. Um, there's Black Pond along the Yellow Trail 
And then across the street, you have this really wide open um, marshy area. There's some great blue heron nests out there that in the tail end of winter and in, in March, you might see some herons or even some owls coming in for, for use of those nests. Um, but there's a lot of wildlife here at Harvard and Littleton um, is a little bit more wild and some of the species that you might not see in Sudbury and Wayland is common are out here. So you could see bear tracks, um, porcupine, other species like that, bobcat are a little bit more common. Um, and it's again, a pretty manageable length with um, connections to opportunities down in more town of Harvard conservation land to the south. So this is a view of that cattail marsh and the great blue heron nests are out here. Um, a really pretty spot, especially as winter comes to an end and our red winged blackbirds come and call, you'll see them out in this marsh. It's a really, really nice spot. Cedar Hill is another really beautiful property um, with a mix of forests and open lands. Um, Great for anything, skiing, cross country, uh, snowshoeing and, and trail walking. That um, Burroughs Loop Trail that I mentioned comes through via the, the aqueduct trail in Southborough and through our Sawwink farm over DCR land and up towards Cedar Hill and continues in Northborough. Um, so some of those longer connections are available here too. But it, there's also really excellent parking from the north parking area at 360 Cedar Hill in Marlboro is a, a commercial um, lot with a lot of good plowed parking spaces. So it can be one that you can go to even as it's still snowing. Um, and the hilltop at Cedar Hill is, is really beautiful. We've done some good habitat management work up there. Um, so there's a nice mix of that open area as well as Crane Swamp all the way along the Crane Swamp Trail has really great wildlife sightings opportunities and a lot of good birds through any season. So I hope you're still, I hope you're not feeling like this, um, but if you are feeling a little bit draggled and ready for spring, um, stay strong because it's coming and it won't be long till the, the red winged blackbirds are out calling. Um, and we see little um, blossoms coming up through the snow and skunk cabbage um, making little holes in the ice as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions about SVT lands or other questions about winter trail use you might have. Okay, um, we have three questions. Um, one is, you spoke about birds and mammals. Are there any insects or reptiles that are seen in the winter? Yeah, so um, one of the, the fun parts about those ruby crowned kinglets is that nobody was really sure what they were eating. And um, there's a really excellent winter book called Winter World by Bernd Heinrich, um, where he describes learning that those birds that are the weight of a nickel are up there in the treetops um, getting little things like inchworms that you wouldn't think were even out in the winter, but they are at, on warm sides of trees. And, and so birds are finding insects like that um, and making their living off of that. Um, so they're there if we look as well. Um, some of the, something that comes to mind is a morning cloak. It's a butterfly that overwinters in our local areas. You won't see them in the winter, but it's the first butterfly you'll see in early spring because they're staying here through the winter and they're not migrating up like a monarch does. Um, in other species, like we didn't talk about um, reptiles or amphibians, but um, they have some amazing adaptations as well. So our wood frogs are able to actually freeze their cells are adapted to um, be able to freeze and thaw out without damaging the cell walls and killing them. Um, so it, it's pretty fascinating about um, what all of our nature does to make it through different strategies to make it through the winter. Um, another bird question, um, what are the best trails to see ducks? Anywhere with open water. Um, so um, there are you know, honestly, a lot of the submissions we get 
for our ducks are more like roadsides. Um, so places like greenways along the Sudbury River, um, areas along Herd Pond would be really excellent for geese and ducks. Um, Steve Foreman, who takes pictures every day, is out at Hager Pond in Marlboro, which is right off of Route 20, as well as the Sudbury Reservoir in Southboro, um, which aren't kind of traditional trails, but anywhere you can find open water is really a good place to look for those waterfowl. Okay, um, another question we have here are, um, what are the pros and cons of feeding deer? Um, I don't think there are any pros. It's, it's pretty, uh, the recommendations from Mass Wildlife and others are pretty strong that you don't feed deer or other mammals through the winter um, because it really, it, it makes them so there's there's a lot of thought that um, backyard feeding forces them to move and use more energy than they would for their natural diets to go between sources um, and bringing them into close contact with a lot also helps to spread diseases. Um, so there's a lot of cons and I, I don't think there are any pros. I don't think you would want to feed deer through the winter. Okay. Um, do you know where coyotes might bed down in the winter? So they'll they'll use dens um, and and other um, kind of dense thickets. So um, places under hemlocks, under um, mountain laurel, places that have you know good cover. But they also range around a lot. Um, but when it comes to raising their their pups, they're going to find um, more of a sheltering den um, under logs or rocks or any shelter like that, that that they can find in the forest. Okay. Um, we have two questions here about salamanders. Um, can you recommend a place to see or observe salamanders when they emerge in the spring? Vernal pools are great. Um, so we, we tend to not promote publicly where they are to avoid having a lot of people go and, and um, accidentally trampling for those, those big nights. So salamanders will make their migration um, from the uplands into vernal pools on those first really cold, rainy, wet nights of the late winter, early spring. Um, but you can kind of follow your ears. And if you are really looking for vernal pools, you can hear um, wood frogs and spring peepers and that's a good indication of, of where to find a vernal pool that you might have even in your backyard. Okay and the other question is is there a group of people who help salamanders in the spring? If so how do I get information about this? There's a, a vernal pool list service. Um, I don't have the address off the top of my head but it's a, a list service online that is a lot of um, land managers and interested people and citizen scientists in vernal pools and vernal pool life. And that's often a really good place to meet other people who are interested in doing the same. Um, so you could look for the Massachusetts Vernal Pool Listserv and that would be a, a good place to start, I think. Okay, and the last question we have here is um, someone who is interested in seeing which animals are in their yard at night. Can you recommend an inexpensive trail camera for use in a residential backyard sure. with Wi-Fi that you can see on your computer or laptop? Yeah, yeah, that's actually, the, so I keep a, a, a three or four um, Blink cameras, which are sold as security cameras, um, but I use them as trail cameras in the back of my yard. And so they're set up, they're, they're little Wi-Fi devices about this big that are triggered by heat and motion, just like a trail camera would be, but they have to be within range of Wi-Fi. So um, I have them, you know, about a hundred feet from my router and they're in the backyard and they take black and white video at night and we'll send a um, notification to your phone when something's out there. Um, so that's Blink that's through Amazon, but there are a lot of other options that are um, basic competitors of, um, all weather Wi-Fi security cameras that work great for wildlife too. Um, and so it, it will save it to a cloud and you can download the images or videos um, to look at later. 
Okay, that is, uh, ends our question and answer segment. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I hope everybody is motivated to get out there and enjoy the winter on our local conservation areas and, and look for some wildlife. Thank you so much, Dan. This was really, it was such a great presentation. I learned, I learned a ton. We appreciate right. it. Um, again, to everybody, we will be, or we have recorded this and we will be posting it online once we have the link. Um, on behalf of the Goodnow Library Foundation and the Sudbury Valley Trustees, I thank you so much all for attending and please stay warm and stay well this winter. Thank you so much. Thanks, Holly. Thank you.